Welcome to Detailed, an original podcast by RCAT. This is a show where we uncover lessons learned to help you navigate your next project. I'm Sharice Lakeside, Senior Spec Writer at RDH Building Science and your host. My guests today are Scott Crawford, partner, and Hannah Cato, associate from LMN Architects in Seattle. As a founding member of LMN's tech studio, Scott values using technology to enhance the design process and create innovative, unique solutions. Scott joined LMN in 2009 and is a versatile designer with a wide range of experience across several sectors, including higher ed and performing arts. He has a particular passion for civic projects where he has the opportunity to engage with the public and create projects that inspire and captivate. Some of Scott's representative projects include the Seattle Aquarium Ocean Pavilion, Bill and Melinda Gates Center for Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Washington, and Octave 9 Risebeck Music Center. Hannah has 10 years of experience spanning a variety of project types, including office, arts and culture, and educational facilities. A detail-oriented and analytical architect, Hannah excels at providing technical support to her team and helping to streamline the design process while increasing efficiency. Girl after my own heart. From small details to the big picture, she is able to shift her scale of focus based on project requirements from highly technical details to a more holistic view. In her work, she is passionate about creating a logical solution that functions well for her client that celebrates a design while also respecting the urban fabric. Her strong technical knowledge and experience in resolving complex design challenges makes her a valuable asset in successful project delivery. The project we are chatting about today in this episode is the Seattle Aquarium Ocean Pavilion in Seattle, Washington. Projected to open this summer, 2024, the Ocean Pavilion will be a -a one-of-a-kind facility integrating a complex building program into Seattle's waterfront and dynamic urban context. LMN and the aquarium's mission focuses on conservation of the marine environment and steering the aquarium experience toward a perspective that embraces the science of ecology, social engagement, and the cultural aspects of our relationship to the global ocean. Now, let's get into the details. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Detail. My guests today are Scott Crawford, partner, and Hannah Cato. Is that correct? (laughs) Hannah Cato. Cato. I said it right the first time. Hannah Cato, associate from LMN Architects in Seattle, Washington. Neighbors. Neighbors of mine. The project we are going to talk about today is the Seattle Aquarium Ocean Pavilion in, guess where? Seattle, Washington. (laughs) Scott and Hannah. Welcome to Detailed. How are you today? Doing well. Thanks for inviting us. Are you hunkering down for the upcoming snow? Uh, Hopefully we'll actually get a little bit more snow up in the mountains and can go enjoy some time out there. Oh, yeah, that would, it's dumping at at Mount Hood, like blizzard conditions dumping. So if you don't get enough up there, just head down to Mount Hood. Yeah, there wasn't Uh much over the break. (laughs) No, my, my, I was supposed to babysit for my son. So he and his wife could go snowboarding and they canceled because there wasn't much over the break. I'm surprised they haven't gotten a phone call yet. There's snow. We're out. (laughs) So I like to start um, every episode with some fun, silly icebreaker question. They're all over the board and what I choose. And with this project, I just, I couldn't help myself. So forgive me. So your icebreaker question is, if you could be any form of sea life, what would it be and why? Go for it, Hannah. Uh, yeah, I'm going to have to go for an otter. I think they're just so happy and fun. I Did you like know that. they also store food in their armpits? <laughs> no. <laughs> just just ruined that for you, didn't we? <laughs> hey, they, they seem to like it. Uh, <laughs> I, I think the one I would go with uh, is an octopus. There's something about the idea of a, a brain that's distributed across your entire body that just sounds like a, a fascinating thing to experience. I love that answer, and I'll tell you why. 
my nickname in the industry is the CSI Kraken. <laughs> and and this is this nickname's been going on for a, no, a number of years all over social media and in uh -huh. CSI and and different things that I do. Uh -huh. So I get gifts of octo octopus things like no I don't want to decorate my house in octopi <laughs> octopi. <laughs> so I, I love that answer. Now people are asking me, oh, is that your nickname because of the Seattle hockey team? <laughs> no, I they know, stole yeah, it yeah. from me. Yeah. No, I've, I've had it long before they were even a glimmer in somebody's eye. So let's talk about this project. I have to admit, when I saw mm -hmm. this, I was really excited because this is a very unique building. Um, and it's my first interview on anything res remotely resembling an aquarium. Like I was like, oh my gosh, mind blown. This could be an hours long interview. So let's start with a little background on the project. What was the mission here for the client? What are they trying to accomplish? Yeah, so uh, we competed for the project back in 2016. Uh, at the time, there was already work going on uh, for the redevelopment of the Seattle waterfront. Uh, there used to be a double-decker highway that was right along the edge of the waterfront that came down. Uh, field operations out of New York were working on the overall master plan. And there was a site that uh, had been uh, left for the expansion of the aquarium. Um, they currently have a pier that's over the water, but then this would allow them to have another facility uh, not over the water. What was really interesting uh, for us was the existing aquarium focuses on the Salish Sea, which is the surrounding body of water uh, within Seattle. And the expansion wanted to take and look at the Pacific Ocean, in particular, uh, the Coral Triangle region, with really the mission of showing the aquarium's conservation work that they're doing in the area and really pushing the idea that even though we have names for a bunch of different oceans, it's really one big body of water and that we need to start thinking about that uh, as we make choices um, as a society and in our relationship to the water. What were the initial specific project goals? What, what for the building, what, what were you trying to achieve? for the actual uh, building itself. Yeah. Um, so th they definitely wanted to take and uh, be able to have a series of large habitats. Uh, the main one is 325,000 gallons. So that's a very big body of water to contain. So they knew that they were going to have that. Uh, and that was uh, directed by the fact that uh, certain animals that they wanted to be able to um, have within that habitat. Uh, they also wanted to be able to show a set of uh, smaller coral habitats. And I'm saying smaller, but these are still 14 plus thousand gallon uh, habitats that they were making. And then even beyond that, a, small, a set of even smaller habitats that you would see in most aquariums. Beyond the animals that they were keeping in the space, there was also a, a desire to be able to have this be a uh, more outward facing uh, facility than what the existing one is with the opportunity to invite guests in and actually have people gather uh, so that you could discuss the conservation work. You could see presentations on this. You could have events happening within the space. Those are some big fish tanks. They are. <laughs> really, we're, we're going to talk more about that. You can be absolutely assured. Yeah. The so, crazy part is all of our okay. tanks that we always talk to as small tanks are still like as big as your desk. So the scale of of the drawings is just kind of hard to wrap your head around sometimes. I would love to see those drawings. One thing that really jumped out at me as I was reading through the information you sent me and then I went off on my own little trolling adventure and other places on the internet to read about this project and what was going on. One thing that really jumped out to me was the level of effort to visibly honor the aquarium's location and the work with the local tribes on planning, design, the cultural framework for the building, site, exhibits, public art. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, that's something that I think we're seeing on a lot of uh, projects, both within Seattle as well uh, around the country. Uh, but for this in particular, given the location uh, of the building right on the edge of the water and the importance of the Salish Sea, which uh, others in Seattle might know of it as Puget Sound, but that is the, the term that the indigenous community uses for the area. There was a desire to have their influence uh, 
in not only the overall planning of this project, but they also, uh, the various groups that we worked with, they acted as ambassadors for the projects as we were doing outreach, uh, or the aquarium was doing outreach to uh, indigenous communities within the Coral Triangle. Um, and it, it just brings a different perspective to the work. And I, I think overall, we really benefit and enjoy having as many influencing voices uh, on our project as possible, not trying to keep it only to ourselves. And so they were helping to enrich some of the ways that we were thinking about the habitats as well as some of the storytelling that could take part and what this place means uh, historically in this area. Well, you taught me something already because I am from born and raised in the Pacific Northwest. And I was sitting here thinking, Salish Sea, what the heck is that? <laughs> I have no idea. I've never heard of that. And I've been to Seattle, I don't know, a bazillion times. But of course, I know the Puget Sound. Mm -hmm. So now I know what you're talking about. <laughs> it's like, do I ask this and look like a complete moron or just kind of skate through? I'll just ask. Uh, uh, so one other thing to add on to that, too, is... Um, well, we, we worked with multiple different individuals from the indigenous community. Um, you know, we worked with Colleen Echohawk to connect us with different voices. And we worked with Valerie Seacrest to, um, she, she's a, correct me, Scott, what is she? She's botanist. a botanist. She, so Valerie Seacrest is a botanist who provided input and guidance on us on our uh, rooftop plantings. So our there's an interpretive story that happens across the rooftop, and we wanted to really honor um, indigenous plantings and kind of you know just what what are species that the tribes historically would use for um, different activities. Um, and then kind of our biggest collaboration that we did was working with uh, the artist Dan Friday. He's traditionally a glass He's traditionally a glass blower, um, and we engaged him early on with our lobby design and kind of the entrance to the building. We had a couple key pieces that we we had kind of held that we wanted to collaborate with someone. Um, so when Dan was selected, we worked with him, and he sketched for our ceiling design. He sketched a pattern that's important to his tribe, and um, it's and. Element, we basically took that pattern that he drew and we took that into our model and created all these parametric designs based off of it. And um, we're actually going to fabricate that in house and install it onto the ceiling. So his artwork and his drawings are actually fully integrated into the architecture. They're not kind of just put on display somewhere, you know, on, on this podium. It's actually just a part of the building. That's that's really cool. What material is it going to be? You guys are doing it in house. We're That's doing cool. it in house. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the material. The material is. Uh, it's called skate light. It's paper composite flat sheet material that we can basically. Uh, we have an in house CNC machine, so we can cut out all the pieces and assemble. We're basically assembling a panelized system that we're going to deliver to the contractor, which we're building in our new shop. Uh, I want to. I want to see. <laughs> I want to see. That's pretty cool. So let's start with a broad description of this project and spaces that needed to be designed. I mean, you touched on, you know, there some of the spaces, but let's get into a little more detail. What sp more specifically types of spaces have are have you designed in this in this building? Um. Yeah. So, and, and, and what was, you know, what was, what kind of drove each of those individual, we talked about the, you know, the bigger mission or vision, um, but you know, what, like you talked about certain animals, you know, maybe in more detail, what, tell me more about the spaces. Yeah. So generally for aquariums, a kind of rule of thumb that you can use is the building is split up into three parts. So you, one third of the space is going to be for the front of house. One third of the space is going to be for back of house. And then one third of the space is going to be for life support systems, which we frequently refer to as LSS. Um, so, you know, front of house is kind of the visitor experience, what's accessible to the public, um, interactive pieces that you're learning from. Um, the back of house is generally staff spaces and areas that support the building, um, support the animals, you know, we have some food prep areas, things like that. And then the LSS is, um, equipment rooms for as far as, far as the eye can see. 
And what, you when, have equipment in this building? There's equipment? Just a, just a little. <laughs> just, yes. Yeah. One of the front of house spaces that I think is worth mentioning, which uh, you might not find at, at most aquariums, is a space that we call One Ocean Hall. Uh, and that is meant to be, it's a, a space that's circular in its configuration. You can see a lot of the different uh, areas or um, habitats that you're going to be able to view into from that space. But it was also seen as a spot for the aquarium to have people gather. And whether that's a classroom of children or someone that's there for an event, um, being able to see people in the round and actually have that connection uh, take place between people within the space rather than just each person having their own experience with the, the various exhibits was really important from the beginning of this. Well, I would imagine that would enrich the experience also, you know, to be able to be looking at something as you're being taught about it. Mm -hmm rather than be off in some classroom somewhere. Right. Actually, I mean, I love that kind of thing where somebody's talking usually, and I forgot to do it today, you know, cause this is still under construction. Normally I'll open up all your pictures on another screen over here so I can look at them while you're telling me about it. Um, so I, I could see how that would be, have a more depth in yeah. the experience. And, and from those spaces, you mentioned the idea of, being able to like create that connection across we're also trying to do that with the surrounding environment so that that's something i think a little bit unique with this of being able to have views out so that while you're learning about something on the interior you're also able to connect it to what's happening in the surrounding area in seattle i can only begin to imagine that there were a host of very unique things um involved in the design of a facility like this. Things that most of us will never encounter in our careers or never have to figure out how that how that works. Can you tell me about some of the unique things in an aquarium that you you know you had to learn about and deal with and figure out? Just I mean, just about there's everything. no aquariums in my history <laughs> and I've been around a while. Um yeah. So, so what were some of the, I love the more challenging ones. What were some of the more challenging things to learn and figure out for an aquarium? Yeah. So this was the first aquarium that uh, we've ever done. Um, so it, and that's the type of project that, that we love working on is being able to kind of immerse ourselves in the specialized knowledge of all the consultants we're working with. I think the habitats themselves, are, um, you're creating these little mini worlds. You have the life support systems uh, for that. You also have the, the structure that you're having to build to contain all of that water, um, which it turns out like when you have 30 feet of water, it actually puts a lot of pressure uh, on the sides of uh, those structures. Um, and then you also have the windows to view into um, those areas. And so being able to create these pieces of acrylic that give you this uh, immersive view into these habitats, um, but then having to think about the, the formwork for how you go about making those and, and those being things that, um, I mean, it's a giant piece of acrylic that is initially made flat and then they make a form and they put it in an oven and they uh, slump that against the form. And we're talking about pieces of acrylic that might be eight inches thick uh, and 30 feet wide while they slump form it uh, against these molds. Um, so the more that we were learning about that fabrication side, uh, the more fascinating all these little bits uh, of an aquarium environment uh, became to us. I would imagine you were really having to detail some crazy stuff. Oh, yeah. To make things like that work. Yeah, there were so many factors that we kind of had to incorporate into the design. So it was, you know, how are the scuba divers going to use this space? What, are the, what do they need? What is their circulation path, not only within the tank, but then also once they exit the tank and, you know, um, dry their equipment, rinse their equipment, and, you know, a whole series of, of sequences that have to happen after that. Um, and... What else were we going to talk about? <laughs> I think if you were to see the uh, coordination documents for the all the piping that's running through, I mean, buildings normally have a bunch of conduit and pipes running through. But once you're talking about an aquarium, now all of a sudden we've got maybe three times as much piping and they're not small pipes. And so to take and work through weaving that three-dimensionally through space so that they can get back to the reservoirs, so they can get to the pumps and filters, so they can get back to the habitats. Um, 
that that was a fun challenge uh, for us to to work through on the project. Um, required a lot of coordination amongst both our building engineers as well as the the folks that are responsible for the life support systems. I, I spent after the economy tanked in two thousand eight. I spent six and a half years working for an MEP firm here in Portland, and so I'm I'm pretty familiar with piping and, you know, writing specs for those kinds of projects. And we never did an aquarium there. Um, but I can imagine that there really had to be much, ah, rabbit hole question, much more, <laughs> a much deeper yeah. level of coordination than we might typically have with your engineers Yeah. <laughs> on something that specialized. Because I imagine they were learning as well. Yeah. And I think it's not just yeah. a deeper level of coordination, it's more people because it's, you, you you've got additional consultants that know exactly how to make those habitats really function. Yeah, there was a lot of work during design. Um, so the life support system, it has a, a sectional relationship. Like not only are you laying it out within the building, but sectionally there's a relationship to the degas tower and the water level in the exhibit and then the fractionators and the pumps and the sand filters. And so all of those have to be laid out sectionally and you have to fit them, not only fit them within the building, but make sure that they have the right relationship to each other. All these words, I, I, I've, I've got probably 10 words already I'm going to look up after this episode. Degas? Uh, yeah, it's like, you're doing what? It's spelled like Degas. And so <laughs> why, like, what is this Degas tower in the project? It's this really cool artistic thing we have. It's going to be beautiful. <laughs> And it's probably some ugly piece of equipment. Um, I read somewhere that this building moves away from the traditional, quote unquote, theater of ecosystems, which I have no idea what that means, model of aquarium design. So explain to me what that means yep. and, and what you did instead. So while we haven't worked on an aquarium before, uh, we were uh, partnering on this project with Think Design uh, out of New York, uh, and they've done a number of aquariums. And one of the terms that they introduced us to uh, was something called fish TV, which is that you walk up to a rectangle and a wall and you look in it like it's a TV and then you move on to the next one. Um, and so what we were trying to do, uh, different than that, was be able to create a, a series of immersive experiences where you're not walking up to just this one rectangle view into uh, the habitat, but instead um, use the geometry of it. So have those uh, windows curved so you can really feel like you can walk into the middle of it, have them come up over your head, give you multiple views into one habitat so you can keep coming back to the same thing uh, and get a different um, perspective on it while also keeping in mind that each time you go to one of those windows, you don't want to see another window because that kind of spoils the immersion. If you're looking across and you see other people looking into the, the same habitat that you're looking into. Um, and, and so that really created a situation where we were constantly trying to think about what you were going to be able to see from each direction and create a circulation path uh, through the building that allowed you to kind of double back on spaces. And so uh, we have a bit of a figure eight uh, as the overall uh, circulation through the building, and that's occurring across multiple levels, and that's uh, using ramping in areas um, to really give you that ability to feel like you're exploring uh, the overall uh, habitat from all these different perspectives rather than just getting that one glimpse and then you move on to the next one, which is potentially a different ecosystem. I, I like that being able to feel like you're more a part of what you're seeing as opposed to viewing. I mean, that gets, it gets a little old going around looking at the little TVs, the fish TVs. Yeah. <laughs> you know, look at this little TV and there's, and they're typically fairly small as well. So what you can see is very limited. You're not really seeing the whole, yeah. the whole ecosystem, the whole relationship of all the different things in there. You're just getting this little snapshot. Yeah, and I, I think with that, the the views, as I was mentioning before, aren't just meant to be something where you look into the habitat and and that's the the total uh, part of the experience. But it's instead being able to turn around and look out these uh, large windows that we have to the surrounding area and be able to make connections for 
the interpretive material that you're learning about in terms of the effect that our behaviors um, have on the environment, you can look out the window and see, okay, I get it. Like they're talking about this here uh, in a hypothetical, but then you can look out the window and, and see our city and wonder like, are, are we doing all we can um, to, to help benefit these environments? I also like that you're looking at the bigger picture in, in our relationship with these environments, not just learning about the environments, but our relationship with those environments and, and what we could be doing differently. Cause there's, there's a lot, <laughs> yeah. a whole lot. So that connection was really important to us during design. So we have a lot of windows in our aquarium, which is also, you know, going away from the traditional aquarium design, which are typically kind of darker buildings that are more enclosed. Um, but because we wanted to make this connection and introduce a lot of windows and which made our aquarium a daylit aquarium. So there was a lot of different pieces that we had to incorporate to basically mitigate the effects of daylight so that to make sure it didn't negatively impact any habitats, you know, so we did, did simulations for every window to, you know, minimize daylighting that comes in and would reflect on any of these windows, but then also shape the actual acrylic to make sure that it's reducing the amount of reflections that are um, reflecting the sunlight from behind you. So there was a lot of study that went into just those geometric relationships to make sure that our daylit aquarium is successful at the end of the day. Rabbit hole question again. I'll probably have 20 on this episode. So I'm curious because this is not the kind of thing any design professional is an expert on as far as the actual ecosystems and yep. the, and the different, you know, um, life in the water. Did you have to um, consult with anybody like marine biologists or um, specialists um, in that area? To ha I mean, cause a lighting consultant, you know, it, they might help you with daylighting in any other environment, but how are they going to know what is best with the habitats? Yeah, so so our exhibit designer is Think Design out of New York, and they actually have within their team a habitat designer who um, he designed basically all of the environments within each habitat, and he I think had the coolest job. So he's an avid scuba diver, and so he basically used his own reference images from around the world when he was designing um, the the habitats and the rock work within each exhibit. Um, so he has a lot of expertise. Think has a lot of expertise. They do a lot of aquarium work, and then also we just wor we worked with the aquarium, you know, because they they have the best. Or they had a lot of expertise, and they had a lot of just connections within the industry of, um, you know, how do you care for this type of animal? How do you care for this type of animal? Um, but those conversations were always just super fascinating to listen to because you know we would talk about one specific animal. And the aquarium, they just know them so well. So they'd be like, oh, no, no, this animal needs X, Y, and Z, but they don't want this, but they do want this. And they need this, this definitely, like, they need this type of habitat. They need this type of, you know, um, they need this amount of sand. Um, and then you'd go to the next animal and they would go down a completely different rabbit hole and list out all the different things that, you know, they just know each uh -huh. animal so well. It's almost like they know a friend you know and they're just constantly advocating for them like no they're not going to like that they're they're going to like this um but i think one of the th cool things that we got to do uh as part of this was um one of the tanks has uh, a set of soft corals uh growing within it and i think we have about 14 feet of water or so within that um Typically, the, and these corals are photosynthetic, so the light is actually important, not just for seeing into the tank, but for them to uh, be able to grow properly. And one of the things that we wanted to do was not have the lights be right in the view, the face of folks as they're viewing into this. And so we wanted to put them on the ceiling about 20 feet up. And there was a question, can we actually get the light to penetrate deep enough into the water? So we took and we got some of the fixtures um, and we worked with the aquarium to use the uh, the habitat that they currently have in Pier 59. And we went over there and we did a set of mock-ups and we actually put a light meter in the water um, and we took and recorded the light levels uh, down at the depth that we were uh, seeking to have the lights penetrate to. So it was really cool to be able to do these mock-ups to 
know that like this isn't just a, a performance mock-up to see whether like it's going to visually give us what we want but like are we going to get the light levels necessary uh, for being able to do this um, which was leading us in really interesting directions of getting to work with manufacturer manufacturers to customize these led fixtures to get a chip put within them that had the correct wavelengths of light for coral but it's otherwise a theatrical fixture that we're using so not something that would typically be used in an aquarium and i think that goes back to the folks that we tend to collaborate with across our range of projects we love being able to see like how do we learn things from performing arts and then bring them to bear in this case on an aquarium that's things i never would have Thought, did you get to get in any of the tanks? I have to ask. No, we keep waiting We're for still a waiting. Pool party, though. <laughs> we, we tried to write that into the specs, but um, did we'll, go we'll so see well. If we get to have it. Yeah, this pool party it, it's been in the planning there, process maybe. for like five years. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, if you if if you had to accommodate scuba divers, it means technically somebody can go in there. <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't know. I think that I would I would have to. I I mean, I know you're not done building it yet, but. I would have to ask just once, hook me up to some equipment and let me go in there and swim around with everything, yeah. but not the sharks. If there's any sharks, I don't want to swim with them, but <laughs> yeah, we joke just... that then one day when we show up on site for a site visit in wetsuits, then you'll know <laughs> accidentally. I'm considering just has... falling in. <laughs> yeah, I was supposed to say just, I'm, oops, sorry, accident. I didn't mean to do that. Um, that's amazing. What an incredible project to get to work on. Um, another thing I was really interested in is I read that you are targeting lead new construction gold on this project. I also read that you are also targeting net zero, net zero carbon and net zero energy. That's targeting a lot. Um, what are you doing to get there? What, what kinds of things are you having to do to try to reach these goals in your design and materials and systems that you're designing yeah so um element sustainability is really important to element and then um the aquarium actually their mission is to inspire conservation so our sustainability goals just made a lot of sense um so we're targeting lead gold and then um recently the owners actually having conversations with ILFI to explore those certifications um but there's a lot of different things that we did um i think one of the one of my favorite examples is um we introduce heat exchangers all around the building. So our HVAC system is an air source heat pump and it's all electric. And our life support system is also all electric. And so both systems traditionally, if they had excess heat, they would just exhaust them to the environment. But we actually went through a lot of work in the beginning of the design to connect the two systems. So if either one of them had excess energy, excess heat, they would just feed into the other system. And so we actually saved a lot of energy by doing that, um, which is really exciting. And then uh, like kind of additionally, we also did the same thing in terms of our water. We have a heat exchange reservoir that actually transfers a lot of our heat over to conserve as much energy as possible. That's pretty creative. And, and these are really interesting discussions early on. Um, so we were working with uh, PAE engineers on the building engineering side and then um, PCA on the, the LSS systems. And so needing to, like, we could have just had them as two separate uh, coordination meetings between the two sides, but being able to pull them together and get them to start talking to each other, I, I think that's what we often see as our greatest role within the project is making sure we're facilitating that communication and, and seeing the potential connections and trying to bring those groups together to see what we can get out of it. Um, because that's where then these interesting things start uh, coming about of ways we can be innovative with how we use those systems. That's interesting. So is the building all electric? Yep. <laughs> I love Seattle. I am not kidding. <laughs> it's, I just I just said this to another guest in the last couple of weeks. Everybody's always chasing Seattle. You know, we think we're really cool down here until we talk to somebody in Seattle. <laughs> Tell me, let's start with, um, we're going to get into design and material specifics. So let's start with the exterior of the building and the site. So tell me about what you had to do with the site yep. to get it prepared, you know, for this this new addition and what kinds of things you designed in your your building enclosure 
Yeah. Um, so when we first started on the project uh, with that field operations master plan that I was mentioning before, there was already an idea of where uh, the aquarium would be located. Um, we don't have actually a specific site when we started this. Like there was no property boundary. We're operating within within the Seattle right of way. Uh, <laughs> so there are some complicated other projects going on around us. There was a road that was being uh, rerouted, designed at the time. It wasn't under construction. There is a, a bridge uh, that is going over that road that a whole nother design team and uh, contractor team was and client team was responsible for. And then there's our project touching all those things in the middle of it. But when we started, we actually looked at, we have a bit of a, a wedge of a site and they wanted initially to put the the mass of the building at the wider part of the wedge, but in our analysis of it, even though it was going to make things maybe a little bit more challenging for our project, we thought that urbanistically it made more sense to pull into the tighter side of the wedge because that allowed us to open up a space that we could have as a public uh, gathering area, um, this elevated plaza with this open view uh, out to the Salish Sea. Um, so that was one of our first moves that we then kept having to figure our way around with everything being tighter, but uh, I think it's going to make for a really exciting space out there. Um, another thing we did was we actually asked the team that was working on the bridge to raise the elevation of the bridge by eight feet because we took a drone out to the site and we uh, did a panoramic view of what we had imagined would be the view from the roof. And we found that uh, some of the piers were perhaps going to block your view to the Salish Sea in certain directions. And we wanted you to be able to have this wide sweeping panoramic view of water across the entire area. Um, they were early enough in the design and willing to work with us that they did agree to move their entire bridge up uh, eight feet, um, which was no small deal uh, at the time. And, and it was really rewarding the first time we got to go up on that roof and actually see that view. And uh, it worked. Uh, we, we do get this wide, expansive view. Um, and the location of this site being in this really unique area of at the edge between the water uh, and downtown really shaped a lot of how we thought about both the the spaces um, that we were creating uh, as well as the expression of the building on the exterior. Um, so we're trying to create a, a set of uh, exterior rooms essentially um, that are open to the public uh, and they occur at near the water level, about 16 feet above that and 50 feet uh, above that. Um, so you have this variety of experiences from all those different directions. On the side of the building that faces out towards the water, uh, that is the front of house side. Um, so that's where we're going to have a lot of those habitats and spaces for visitors to come and enjoy. And we're trying to highlight views uh, both out to the Salish Sea through one window, as well as down the entire waterfront to Mount Tahoma, which this is another name that we learned. That's actually the indigenous name for Mount Rainier. Um, so we highlight those two spaces from the visitor side, uh, and that edge of the building is treated more like uh, conceptually a, a bluff that you might find uh, along the the coastline. Um, so we're using more natural materials there. We have a timber facade um, rain screen that um, is composed of Alaskan yellow cedar that we worked very closely with the contractor uh, Turner to source from an indigenous, uh, indigenously held uh, forest that um, they are going to be able to provide to us uh, for the project. Um, and it'll just be naturally finished and it'll age in silver over time. And then on the uh, the city side of the building, that's where we have a lot of our back of house and life support areas. And so that was in its function, more of this machine. And so it has more of a metal panel uh, system that fits into the industrial ish character of that edge of downtown, more of the, the working side of things. Um, there's the Seattle city light building. That's not far away. That also is fairly industrial. So we're trying to take on all the different sides of the building and consider what its relationship is to its context in direct proximity to it. Um, and, and the crazy thing is like oftentimes a building will be 
uh, said to have like the the backside of the building that not many people see. There is no backside to this. You you are able as a, a visitor to experience all sides uh, at once. Um, but in doing all of this, we created this, I think, unique way for the building to fit within its context. Um, and it's also enriching it, in in our opinion, uh, to a great degree, because with our project and the way in which we're tying into some of those other surrounding projects, you will now be able to walk from the waterfront all the way to Pike Place Market, uh, a connection that uh, normally did not exist as seamlessly as it's going to when this opens up. That is, that is fantastic. It sounds like you could walk up to this building and depending on which way you approach it, you could feel like you're looking at a different building. Yeah. Because yeah. of making the different sides fit to what's immediately around them. Yep. Um, but that's an ingenious solution because most people would not do that. It's, you know, it, it's going to be one, one enclosure and one material all the way around, but that is such a unique area. Yeah. Um, and to, to, to have that wood on the side, you know, by the sea. And, um, I bet you that's going to be beautiful. I, I'm due for a Seattle visit. This summer. <laughs> this summer. So I can't even begin to think about what the interior design or any of the interiors, materials and things, uh, were required for, for a facility that is this unique, um, but I'm imagining that you did some interesting things with the interiors and the art in the in this building. So we already talked about the ceiling, which I think is super cool. Um, tell me a little bit about interior finishes and interior design of spaces and what what you did and what what was I always I, I call the interiors the touchy feelies. Um, what what was the intent? How are you intending to make people feel by s some of your interior design? Yeah, I mentioned before the the circulation pattern, the idea of there's not a prescribed route that you're supposed to take through the building. Like there is an entrance and you'll go up the entrance ramp. But once you go there, it's a bit of choose your own adventure with the, the hope that people are lingering within the space um, rather than uh, just going on a forced march through and then you get to the exit and you go through the gift shop and you're done. Um, and so with that, we wanted to think about what was going to cause people to linger within these spaces. Um, so one of the other things that we're going to be responsible for, uh, fabricating on this project is we have about a 60 foot long bench um, that is a semicircle within the one ocean hall space it actually has two tiers of seating um, as part of it and that's meant to offer the ability for folks to take a pause soak it all in get up move around uh, we worked with think on the design of that space so that it'll be actually in addition to the habitats you can see from there um, there will be uh, projection mapping on a lot of the railing uh, surfaces. So you'll be able to have various video content projected around the walls, as well as on the, the one habitat, the archipelago, which contains those uh, coral exhibits. Um, there will be projection that can happen on that as well. Um, so really trying to take advantage of all the surfaces that we have to uh, help enrich the overall uh, experience. Um, Hannah, you want to talk about some of the uh, humidity related things? <laughs> Well, I was going to say, so Sharice, almost similar to how we approach the exterior where you're approaching this building from all sides. Once you're inside the building, we design the exhibits so you can approach them from any side too. So there's also not a backside to any exhibit. So you can circulate around them, see them from above, see them from below, um, which, which had its own kind of set of challenges um, and just different constraints that we had to incorporate into creating those exhibit structures. Um, so our large vessel is 325,000 gallons. Um, so it's three stories high. Um, but to contain that much water, the amount of hydrostatic pressure that's actually pushing out on those walls increased the thickness of our walls to like 24 inches thick. And so when we were designing this with our structural engineer, they said, you know, at this point, you're holding up the roof for free. So we actually extended the tank all the way up to the roof. And so it supports all of our roof. Beam. That public roof is basically just sitting and resting on our tank. Um, but yeah, so 
it's just a, a structural feat of engineering. The amount of rebar that's in the structure is, I think it's over a million pounds of rebar, which is like typically what would, you would see in a 60 story sheer wall is within our exhibit. Um, so yeah, but the water, there's uh, a lot of humidity concerns that come with that and just kind of how we mitigate that. It's also um, because we're, Coral Triangle is all warm water exhibit, so our building has a lot of warm water. And so just how we mitigate that and handle that with our HVA system was all, you know, perfectly in tuned. Our, our MEP designers designed specifically to the temperature that the tank would be held at, essentially. The, the, there was a number of uh, drawings within the set that would call out the humidity and water conditions within spaces so that you knew whether or not you had to use stainless steel hanger rods or whether you could use galvanized or whether you had to use a marine grade lighting fixture, or whether you could use a normal one. And so there's a lot of things that happen uh, on the, the functional pragmatic side with an aquarium um, that you have to pay attention to because you've got salt water in the space. So highly corrosive and you got to make sure that this is all going to last for a long time. I, I'm I'm glad you brought up humidity because I didn't even think about that, but that must have affected because it's everything. salt water and because everything. it's humid. Every single material choice you made in yeah. the interior building. Yep. Yeah, we actually even even things like I don't know if you have carpet, but you know flooring materials and yep. and materials on the walls. I imagine. Yeah, we I had a. I don't even know what you would choose. <laughs> yeah, we had a subcontractor I think who has said. This is the first project where I've done marine grade plywood on the inside of the building. But yeah, we we had to factor that into every material choice that we made. And it was not only, we basically have a, a matrix of all of our rooms and how wet is it expected to be? How is there expected to be water on the floor? Is there expected to be splashing? You know, are you adjacent to a, a body of water? Like if you're within four feet of a tank, you need to have your protection level has to increase. Um, so it there was a lot of coordination to to get all those pieces right. I imagine there's more hard surfaces than soft ones. I mean I mean like I'm I'm just thinking things like acoustical ceiling panels or yeah. you know um wall finishes that are maybe yeah uh you know not you know soak that up if if you don't choose the right thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, we do have a couple softer surfaces, I guess, as you would describe them. But um, it's basically just making sure that every material can handle the amount of expected humidity. Um, so we were just always reviewing that. Okay, so let's talk about water some more. I've been waiting for this question <laughs> because that that truly was the first thing I thought of is how do you contain all that water? Um, you know, we have a lot of architects that listen to this this podcast. And so obviously an aquarium is going to involve massive amounts of water. You've already told us this one does. Uh, that's a lot of pressure on the enclosures. Um, and you, you, you touched on that a little bit in the last question, but tell me, okay, I'm pretend I'm a complete newbie and I am about to go design something that's going to require a lot of water. What do I need to know right out of the gate um, when you're designing a rent? That's that weight and that pressure is immense. You know, it's not a couple of quick, easy fixes, I don't imagine. And then you're adding salt on top of it. So then, you know, salt water. So that's a whole nother layer to that water thing I didn't think of before. What do I need to know? And what do you have to do differently as opposed to some normal building to make sure that that doesn't you know, come breaking through a window or a wall or whatever and drowning everybody. Wouldn't that be exciting? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. Um, yeah, I guess, well, you kind of mentioned already water's heavy. Uh, I think it's like per cubic foot, it's 8.36 pounds or something like that. So um, it's really heavy. So our structural engineer had a lot of um, constraints they had to design around and just, yeah, we talked about the hydrostatic pressure and making sure it doesn't push out on the actual structure. Um, and then, yeah, just the amount of humidity that it generates, the pipes that go into it um, are, in our specific case, we have a waterproofing admixture in the concrete around all of our exhibits. And then we have a waterproofing membrane, which we've always kind of talked about as, it's like a belt and suspenders 
approach to it. So it, we have the two systems that contain all of our exhibits. Um, and then basically on top of that is your rock work and the habitats that are within there. Um, yeah, coordinating all the piping, getting all the piping in and out and around the tanks. Um, what was interesting was they, they took and they place all the, the concrete for the, the main habitat. So you have the structure, you strip the formwork off. Uh, and after they went through and cleaned all of that up, they fill it up with water. And then they, and at that point, the acrylics installed as well, but they fill it up and they watch and find where it leaks because it's definitely going to leak somewhere. Uh, and then they have to go in and uh, inject into the cracks uh, a sealant to help uh, seal all of that up. And then they can come back and put that uh, waterproofing membrane that Hannah was talking about, and they'll do another test uh, again from that. Um, so th this like multiple steps, and, and these were things that we were told about early on um, in the project because that was going to affect the construction schedule because all of a sudden you're going to have to fill this thing up <laughs> with water. Um, how long did it take them, Hannah? 20 Couple days. Yeah. To fill the tank with water, I think it takes two days. Yeah. So um, I'm assuming this waterproofing membrane is like a fluid applied. It's a, yeah, it's cementitious based. So it's fluid applied and it actually um, has a, a bit of a flex to it. So it can handle if there's any kind of settling or moving that happens over time. Um, all right, here's maybe a better answer to your first question. <laughs> you want to piece them together later, but um, the structure itself. So we wanted to remove any cold joints that happen within the body of water. So I think that's about 24 feet up, 30 feet up. And, um, so when the contractor was coordinating the, the pour for the large exhibit, um, it's and it, the surfaces are all curvilinear on each side. There's very few flat areas. And so we ended up working with Janicki. We connected the contractor with Janicki, who's traditionally an aerospace engineer. And they CNC'd foam panels and assembled them all on site. So it's 250 unique foam panels that are connected on both sides and then they're poured into. But because we didn't want any cold joints, they had to build the entire structure up at 24 feet. And just the, the natural shape is a little bit, almost an inverted pyramid, if you can imagine that. Um, and so the bottom, when they poured this whole thing, that bottom piece was completely blind and the contractor couldn't actually get down and see into that piece be to avoid these cold joints. And so the concrete pour was this big event on our construction schedule that everybody was looking forward to. And, you know, everyone came out to site that day to watch concrete get poured yeah. for 21 hours. I showed and... up at three o'clock in the morning at the end of November. So it was cold and it was dark, but I've never been so fascinated watching uh, concrete get placed. <laughs> a little pins and needles maybe as well. Oh yeah. It was definitely a little, a little like... of that. And it's one of those things that the, the concrete, um, was a special mixture. There's actually no aggregate in it. It's more of a grout because of the density of the rebar in order to get to flow through everything. And so because of that, it, it was like a milkshake. And uh, so they would have instances where um, all those pieces of formwork that we have, there's gaps and seams in between it. And occasionally you could get a blowout and you'd all of a sudden see a crew of people like go over and just like take that on and like work really quickly to to patch that blowout and then they just keep going with the rest of the pouring i would have loved to have seen that yeah i, I just i there's i've a never heard of somewhere. anybody doing anything like okay i'll go I'll, <laughs> I'll be digging i'll be digging around um there was a deliberate focus on healthy material choices in this building and and i didn't realize how interesting I would find that question till just now after what we've already talked about, you know, with the, the extra considerations you had to make about materials beyond just looking for healthy materials, you know, because of the type of building it is and because of the humidity um, and, you know, being what's going to be a very high traffic facility, at least in the mm -hmm. public areas. Um, can you talk to me more about how you were making these healthy material choices and how you were finding the things you you needed in a building like this. Hmm. Yeah, we 
choosing healthy materials is always very important to us. And, you know, we try to use as many recycled materials as we can, things of that nature. Um, we've talked about a lot of them so far, but one of my favorites is, is actually the the carpet in the building. It's made of recycled fishing nets and recycled water bottles, which just, you know, reinforces the story of the aquarium and kind of their mission, which I think is really great. Um, we also made a lot of efforts to, re to reduce the embodied carpet carpet on this building. So um, we just use that as a reference point when we were selecting materials. Um, we were constantly, you know, doing calculations to see. So I think um, the structure, the concrete in our building, we've reduced the embodied carbon by 38%. And then in the overall building, 32%. That's amazing. There had to be a ton of lessons learned. I mean, you're probably still learning them because it's not completely finished yet. And some of our best lessons come during construction. Um, so specifically to design first, um, can each of you just tell me one major lesson you learned that will, whether it's a project like this or a different kinds of project that will change the way you approach that, whatever it is on the next project that you know, maybe you'll know to ask this question sooner, or you'll do this differently because you figured out through the process of trying different things that this was going to work the best. What would you say each of you has so far been your biggest lesson learned? I think one of the, so when I started at uh, LMN 14, 15 years ago, uh, I was in this uh, R&D group in the office uh, called Tech Studio. And we were meant to bring emerging technologies into the practice. And, and I think we, we still take and put a lot of effort into that. And the tools that we employed on this project uh, were uh, definitely um, allowed us to take and achieve what we did in the end. But I, I think it's less about the technology and more about the thing that like, at this point, I'm not surprised anymore, but I was initially in my career. Um, you can have all these tools and technologies that seem like they're the latest whiz bang thing that's going to make everything great. But really at the end of the day, it's going to come down to communication and whether that's a conversation you're having or a drawing that you're putting together or a model that you're sharing with someone, the more clearly you can take and articulate the direction that uh, the design is wanting to go and what the issues are and how you might approach them. And the more that you can draw out the answers uh, from those with the specialized knowledge, the more successful you're going to be in the project in the end, because we can take and work in a vacuum and create all kinds of crazy models of things, but those aren't going to necessarily work in the end if we're not having it informed by um, the the specialized knowledge uh, of those that we're working with. And, and I think on this project, we were able to place ourselves in a position very intentionally at the beginning to say like, let us be the translator into the 3D geometry of the things that everyone is looking at. Um, and so we could handle the complexity of that geometry, but allow their knowledge to directly inform what we're doing. Um, and it's really great to do that because not everyone is necessarily going to know the latest 3D modeling software or parametric modeling or how to use a CNC machine. But if we can take and be the ones that operate on those sides and just make sure that we're open to having that conversation with everyone and actually understanding what their focus is rather than just forcing them to adopt our vision. Um, we end up with a more successful result in the end. And I love that that's your answer because you would think that that communication and that collaboration with all the right people at the right times would be inherent in our industry. And sure, it happens on every project. We don't always do a really great job of it, though, of doing it efficiently at the right, you know, right times. I mentor a lot of young professionals, and I often will hear the statement, oh, I, I didn't want to ask my boss a stupid question. Right. And I'm like, oh, my God, ask the stupid question. <laughs> If I was your boss, you, you're going to be the one I promote somewhere down the road because you were confident enough to ask. If, if you have to ask the question, it's not a stupid question. Yeah. Or and a I want stupid you to question get it right. is better than a stupid mistake. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, I like I'm stealing. I'm stealing that. Oh, that, that's becoming part of my mantra. Um, but, you know, we do that on every project, but we don't always do it well, or we don't always do it in a timely manner. And I saw 
because I've worked on the other side of the fence mm -hmm. and I've worked I, and I'm working, you know, I worked in MEP engineering for six and a half years. Most of my career has been in architecture and now I'm working in building science and, and you see it, you know, when you see it from both sides of when information is say coming to the consultants or being asked of the consultants, as opposed to when it should be, when that conversation should have happened. Um, so that's like my, my favorite, favorite answer ever. Um, Hannah, how about you? What was your um, biggest lesson learned so far on this project? Yeah, I would say really similarly, kind of just seeing firsthand and kind of up close the construction process and kind of filing away like a lot of small nuggets of, you know, how could you document something more clearly? How could you document something that the subcontractor is going to understand in their own, their language? Uh, you know, and so I, I think I just have a lot of those moving forward. Yeah, I I joke with people all the time, get out from behind your desk and get out there and watch them build it. Get your hands dirty. Yeah. See how it comes together because it does. It will inform the way that you design and and how you approach a challenge on a project if you've actually seen it come together on the job site. Yeah, and uh, so, just a, a broader uh, aspect of that for us Um what you were just saying is really important to us as a practice. Uh, Hannah mentioned before the the shop that we have um, that uh, we're going to be fabricating a few of these components out of. Uh, and that arose from this understanding that like the computers and the drawings that we're creating are all well and good. But if we don't actually understand what those lines represent on that sheet, then uh, we're not necessarily going to be able to achieve the greatest extent of what our design intent uh, is. And so um, it's a space that for a while was in a basement, but now it's a, a storefront space uh, right in Pioneer Square in Seattle, uh, which is great because we can use it both as this uh, 6,000 square foot shop where we can make our own things for projects or make prototypes and mock-ups, but it also allows us to invite people into that space and be able to demonstrate to them that we really do care about how this all comes about. And like that space is a representation of it. And we want to have that level of uh, collaboration. Well, kudos to both of you and your firm for that forward thinking collaborative mindset, because I think we need more of that everywhere in our industry um, to really be able to take it to the next level. So construction is underway. We're not done yet. It, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, 2025 it's expected to be finished? Um, or? No, it should be open to the public summer <laughs> summer in 2024. Oh, wow. Okay, so we're in I'm the totally home stretch. There. Yeah. You're in the home stretch. So this project is in a prominent place in the Seattle waterfront, um, which is a, I know firsthand is a very very busy kind of tight area um tell me a little bit about how construction has been coming together the sequencing and coordination things plus you guys have this added thing of this bridge and this road <laughs> like I, i'm like I, mind blown on how you're designing this building and how you got them to raise a bridge eight feet that could be a whole nother episode we all know it takes years to get anybody to build the bridge and you actually got them to raise it eight feet. That is, that alone is huge kudos. So what, how's construction been going? Any surprises, anything that caused you to pivot um, major challenges just with that coordinating in such a busy area of town? Yeah. Yeah. So, well, you kind of mentioned it, but not only are we downtown, we're in the middle of two other active projects. So when we drew our, our drawings around the project, we, we have no site area in our project. It's just the building itself um, because all, all around us is the main corridor promenade project that's ongoing. And it's so when we drew our drawings, it, we said existing conditions, but our existing conditions did not exist yet. Um, so that project is ongoing. And then at the same time, the city's Overlook Walk project, which is that bridge, is also ongoing. And um, that bridge actually has foundations that go into our basement. And so <laughs> we, like, needless to say, there's so much coordination that's happening with these three contractors that are all on top of each other. Um, even just like the connection to Overlook Walk, there's areas of our building where 
you know, where the substructure, where the waterproofing, it's our insulation, and then the boundary actually flips to the other project, and then it's their insulation, their paving, and then their finishes. So just those two contractors working together, um, there's there's a lot of coordination that's happens that has been happening, and just the the three of them all together are kind of constantly pivoting, or you know you have lay down space. Can I borrow this lay down space for tomorrow? And I'll give you back some of this, you know, the next day after that. Um, so there's a lot of that going on. And then kind of not even adding in the cruise ship port is two blocks away. So on cruise ship days all throughout this past summer, um, we actually had to, the, the road has flipped to the other side of our building. So it was existing, it was on the west side of the building, it's flipped to the east side, but we actually had to keep that west lane open to allow cruise ship traffic to come through our project. But the cruise ship traffic is literally driving through our construction site. They pull back the fences and tour buses drive through our construction site to get through. Um, so there was a lot of coordination that had to happen during construction. Sounds like projects that could drive somebody to drink. Um, <laughs> I just, there's, there's, there's so many things. It's hard enough to just to sequence and coordinate just a normal or regular old project with clear boundary lines. And, and, and I know for a fact that area of town, there's like no parking. Yep. Um, it's it tons and tons of tourists. I mean, is there space on, on this I know there's no site, site lines no. on this big land area for people, for the, the contractors to put things like their equipment and, and nope. Car oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So our, Jeez. our contractor is Turner construction and they've been really great. And their favorite line that they like to say is this building would be hard to build in a cornfield and like adding in all of these urban factors is just um, been, been a challenge. Takes it to the so, next level. <laughs> I, I I would imagine that this is the kind of project that almost makes your career because you have so many lessons you learn every day because everything is unique and different and a challenge to be solved on so many different levels that the knowledge you would walk away with has to be immense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think actually the really cool thing on this project is everybody is in that state of mind and so everybody looks at it from a really collaborative point of view it's like okay you know everybody is their egos are at the door and it's like okay how are we going to get this done you know we'll be in meetings with subcontractors the design team the contractor the owner and everybody's just you know throwing out ideas of how do we solve you know this next issue that's popped up and you know how do we pivot how do we how do we um get through this and um so just watching the teams work together has been really, really cool to see. I think it could be, this type of project could be really ugly if you didn't have everybody come to the table with that mindset. Yeah. Because uh, there's just, there's too many cooks in the kitchen. And that's challenging in anything that you do in life. Uh, but something this complicated and this unique that a lot of people have never done before, you know, so everybody's learning new things every day. So that's that's amazing. What is... For each of you, what is your favorite area, favorite spot in this building or, or part that you're most proud of? I, I think for me, it's going to be the, the rooftop. Um, I, I think when that opens, it, it's a, a space I could imagine uh, constantly going out there and actually having lunch up on it. It's such a weird, you're in this elevated position 50 feet off the waterfront, but yet you also feel like you're on a street that connects uh, up towards the market. Uh, and I think it's going to be a really exciting space for everyone in the city to be able to come and enjoy. Okay, Hannah, before I have you answer that question, I'm going to go down a rabbit hole. <laughs> Tell me about the rooftop. All right. Um, I didn't realize there was a rooftop thing going on. That yeah. totally would have been in my questions. So yeah, tell so me what they can punch it in back in the design area or whatever, but tell me about what you're doing with this rooftop. So field operations was uh, responsible for the entire uh, waterfront master plan. And then we also had them on our team as the landscape architects. They're also the landscape architects on the Overlook Walk project, which is the bridge that crosses over the new road. Um, so because they were on both teams, we actually worked very closely with them to take what they had already been planning as a set of 
um, gathering spaces and gardens on the Overlook Walk. Uh, and we looked at being able to reshape some of those and have them tie seamlessly into uh, the roof of our building. This wasn't something that uh, was necessarily required of the project from the very beginning, um, but it felt like there was already this sequence of spaces that were happening with these elevated gardens that we should probably continue that as well. Um, so we have a couple different areas there. We have uh, one area that during design we referred to as the, the sunset seating, uh, which is uh, we actually mapped it out for uh, winter to summer sunset so that it kind of gives you the full uh, breadth of the view uh, out across the Salish Sea to the uh, the Olympics. Uh, and that, I think, is going to be a pretty breathtaking space. Um, it's got cedar uh, plank seating uh, that's part of it uh, at multiple tiers. Uh, at the south end of the building, we have another set of seats that will look down uh, the length of the waterfront uh, and is on axis uh, with Mount Rainier. Um, and then there's a set of gardens in that area that we collaborated with uh, Valerie, who Hannah mentioned before, to select uh, a, a planting palette um, that takes and highlights um, the various plants that indigenous communities of the area would use both for, say, basket weaving or for medicine or for food. Uh, so the, the gardens up there are meant to be yet another interpretive moment uh, of that region and place that we're, we're fitting with it. Um, it's situated or the circulation is laid out in such a way that um, you've got views that are unencumbered by railings because we have an upper viewing area and a lower viewing area. Uh, so that will be really exciting. And then that also allows for an event uh, to happen up there with the public still able to circulate around the edges of that. So this roof is the roof that's just basically sitting on top of that three-story tank. You got it. So I need to know what is... <laughs> What is your roof made of? What is What are the components of this roofing system? Yeah. Uh, so we have a collection of um, steel wide flange beams that uh, are all custom because they actually are kinked in profile to allow the seating to fit onto the slope of that. Uh, sitting on top of the beams are hollow core concrete planks. Um, so we worked early on. We got a tour of a facility uh, here in the Northwest called Concrete Tech. We learned that they make these things 600 feet at a time in a large yard, and then they just slice them up. Uh, so we worked with them to come up with a plan for how we could uh, be able to put those in place. And the advantage of them is they can span about 20 feet, and they could just easily install them very quickly. Um, there's a topping slab that goes on top of that, a waterproofing membrane, and then we're using... Um, the insulation for both uh, being able to take and get the thermal resistance that we need, as well as it starts to give the overall shaping uh, of the roof. And then there's another finished slab that goes over top of that. My mind is exploding. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to be doing so much research after this episode. <laughs> Hannah, I didn't forget. So what is your, what is your favorite part of this building? Uh, my favorite part is this window that we call the Oculus window. And um, so the main exhibit, it actually cantilevers over the front door of the building. So we have this big overhang that shelters people from the public. And within that area, we actually introduced a skylight into the main exhibit. So it's an exterior skylight. So if you're waiting in line to enter the building, you can look up and see animals swimming overhead. But also my favorite part is that if you're not going to buy a ticket, if you're just walking along the waterfront, you can walk past this and get a glimpse into the main exhibit of the building, um, which is just a really cool, you know, kind of gift back to the city. I, I cannot, it, it opens in, did you say July? Uh, sometime this summer. They don't sometime date, no. this summer? We'll see when the I mean, animals I, are ready. I'm, I'm due for... I, maybe I'll, I, I'm a, se a timber season ticket holder. So maybe I'll, whenever the timbers are up in Seattle, maybe I'll come up there and check it out if it's open. So I usually close every episode with two questions. One's a more broad industry, industry question. And then another one is the final question everybody gets. So I imagine it would be, could be, somewhat terrifying, in my opinion, to take on a project this unique with so many things that you have to learn, um, especially if you've never done it before, even with consultants, 
who have. There's still going to be all kinds of unique things you have to do. What advice would you give anyone taking on any kind of first time unique project? What steps could they take from the get go to jump off that bridge with some success? I would say we, one, we love first time projects. Um, I, I would say as an office, um, we really relish the, the ones that are going to be challenging and force us to do something different than we've done uh, in the past. And I, I think key to that is uh, having an open mind from the very beginning and knowing that all the voices that you're working with actually have something to contribute to that. And along the way, just ask a lot of what if questions, uh, because that's where you're actually going to find the opportunities. But if the shark breaks out of the tank, we actually had those conversations. We, well, actually, our acrylic is a it's a performance specification. So in the performance spec, it says the acrylic needs to withstand the force of a I can't remember if it was like a six hundred pound shark swimming at a ramming speed. Oh. Okay. I want to write one spec where I get to type <laughs> something like that into it. It's uh, it's one of the better parts of our spec spec book. I, I love that. I mean, you know, as spec writers, we don't get to do a lot of unique things sometimes. <laughs> I, I got approached by a recruiter once to work for Disney. And for a hot second, I thought about it just because I thought well, you're going to be yeah. writing some really unique specs for Disney. <laughs> yeah. So final question. Uh, we close every episode with this question. As individuals, we all hope to live a life that leaves some kind of contribution to make the world a better place. I jokingly call that mission my personal world domination statement. Not, and that doesn't mean the whole world, but how can I dominate my world? How can I make a difference in my world? So for you guys, personal or professional, whichever you choose, how do you as an individual hope to make a difference or an impact on your world? What is your personal world domination statement? Go for it, Hannah. It's a little uh, tiny question. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think mine would be, I always hope to see logic prevail. And I think that is interpreted differently in a lot of different situations. But um, I, I think it's always frustrating to me when, you know, this is the way it's always been. So this is the way we're always going to keep doing it. Um, so just kind of questioning those situations. You're my favorite person right now. We've always... <laughs> I, I have I, I teach a class on project delivery and I have a list of statements my students can't make or I'll kick them out of class. I'm not really going to kick them out of class. I just tell them that. <laughs> and one of them is we've always done it this way. Or it is what it is. I, I yeah. can't stand that statement. Yeah. Or, or we'll let the contractor deal with that during construction. There's a whole list. I had to yeah. start writing them down because there's a whole list. <laughs> How about you, Scott? What is your um, personal world domination statement? Uh, I'm putting this one out there for Stu Kibbe at Turner. <laughs> uh, I, I think the, the built environment could use more curves. Um, I, I think just because uh, the rectangle might be simple, you can make a beautiful box, but it doesn't mean that everything needs to, to try to be that. Um, and, and there's a lot that we can learn from the way the natural world shapes things that actually excites something, I think, within us as humans and connects us to something that... Um, you can't really put your finger on what exactly it is, but um, it's exciting when you're there. Get out of the box. I love that. Scott and Hannah, I can't thank you enough for taking time out of your busy schedules to join me today. This has been absolutely delightful Great. and informative and entertaining, and I can't wait to come up and see the project when it's done. Yeah, let us know when you're here. I, I, de I definitely will. I'll, I can't. Behind the scenes tour. I want to see it all. <laughs> I will definitely call you. Thank you again for joining me today. Yeah, it was great talking yeah. to you. 